now. Or uh, all ventilator stuff you said. So when I worked there, you only made one specific alloy called Mic 6. And That's you're trying to expand me. to a couple different types. Did, did you do that or is it still just Mike 6 there? It's still just Mike 6. And that's just in the plate because down in down the sheet mill, um, they have all different alloys and they mix them all up in the, the melders and add different amounts of zinc and magnesium and all these different things that they throw into the melder to get the right um, chemistry before they turn it into rolls of sheet. Um, but you only have one chemistry up here, right? That gets all melted down? That's correct, yes. Right. Okay. So I, I started the recording a little bit late. So for those that are watching this later, I was going over the location of the Arconic plant. So right here is Park City and right here is Mannheim Pike uh, 72 and right here is 283. Um, so you can get into the plant two different ways. Sean and I would usually come in Apollo Drive right here to the, to the plate facility and just uh, distance ourselves as much as possible from the sheep people. <laughs> and we... <laughs> We call this down the hill because this is kind of on an elevation here. So you can look down and see most of this, most of the rest of this plant. So you talk about going down the hill, go down the hill for the cafeteria or to the uh, storeroom to get parts and uh, try not to mix with the unwashed masses as much as possible. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. That's, that's where I started out. I actually started out as a, uh, a flatbed driver down here. And then I got into maintenance as soon as I could um, because there wasn't any openings and maintenance, but I wanted to get into the maintenance in Arconic and I left a maintenance position in another place. So I took the only job I could to get in there. And then I bid, once you're internal to Arconic, you can bid on um, job openings. When they open up, they open up to just people that are current employees first. And then if they can't fill the position, then they open it up to outside people. Um, so I knew once I got in there, I'd have a lot more opportunity to move. So then I went to mechanical maintenance right here that um, serves all the mechanical like crane stuff and uh, gears and sprockets and PMs and lubrication, all the things you would think of for mechanical maintenance um, in the entire sheet mill, but they're not dual trade down there. So I just did mechanical and there was electricians that did all the electrical work to the point where we weren't even allowed to like disconnect power to anything in mechanical maintenance. We had to call an electrician and wait for him to come to do it. Um, and that's still the same way now they're there now it, it, it's it's still the mechanical maintenance is not allowed to turn dis certain disconnects off uh depending on the voltage to, they're not allowed to they have to call an electrician to do that uh yeah. for changing the motor they'll have to call you know they'll be able to uh, call an electrician to disconnect the motor and then mechanical maintenance will you know take the out put a new motor in you know do an alignment and then they'll call an electrician to hook the motor up which you kind of see how inefficient that is <laughs> yeah that's how I was do it I was talking to Sean yesterday when we were getting the Zoom part straightened out and I was telling him how I remember what a pain in the ass it was because you would have to call an electrician and wait for him to come just to switch off a disconnect and put a lock on it. And then you would do your five minutes of work and then you'd have to wait for him to come back again to unlock the thing so that you could test it to see if it worked. And you were just beholden to whenever they felt like showing up, depending on what else they were doing or if it was their lunch break or whatever. And it was really inefficient. Um, the exact opposite. If you want to talk about how it works in plate, Sean, I feel like I'm, I'm, uh, I asked you on here, now I'm doing all the talking. <laughs> um, the uh, plate is the exact opposite. So if you want to talk about how dual trade works at plate, and plate is the only place that has that. The whole other plant, um, everywhere else in the plant is you're one or the other. But Sean's dual trade and our program is all dual trade. So ideally, we would be up here in plate. You guys would. So if you want to talk a little bit about how it works up there, Sean. Typically up here, if we get it, well, we had today, I'll give you a good example. We had a uh, breakdown of, we have a, a stacker that uh, actually stacks the plates um, off of a mill. And, uh, you know, some days I could be coming in, working with some of the high voltage stuff if we have a problem back there, or I could be working, you know, on a PLC, um, checking out. We always use the, the laptop for checking programs because that's, that's the easiest way to troubleshoot a piece of equipment. I mean, if it's, if something's not happening and you think it should be, you look at the program and, and, and determine what's going on. Cause I could tell you if there's a, a proximity switch is going bad, a limit switch is going bad. Something's not making in uh, that rung of, of logic to, to happen. And then once you figure that out, you go into the mechanical mode and go, at, go into fixing it, whether it be, you know, replacing a solenoid valve, um, a sprocket could have come bad on a rail car or, or one of our pieces of equipment. Um, you could have had a coupling come loose, a shaft break. Um, so every day, and that's what I like about doing dual trade. And I've, I've done that 
you know, for all but 25 years here. And I did it about eight years at a, uh, my old position before I started here. And, uh, you get to know how the pieces of equipment works, uh, better. I, I, I think if you're just doing the electrical part of it, you're not looking at, you know, you're just looking at the electronics and the programs, but you're not really seeing the big picture if that, that makes sense. And that's, what's nice about up here. And not only that, it, it takes you, it's, you learn equipment better, you have better knowledge of it. So it takes you a lot less time to, to, to get to the root cause and, and fix it and get it back up online. Uh, so you, you're back to making product and, and that's how it works up here. Typically we have for the longest time, it was just me on shifts. Um, but over the years, you know, with, with, you know, safety has come as our, our top priority here. So they've, they've, you know, when you get an electrical panel, it's good to have a second guy. It's good to have a second guy that's uh, CPR certified in case something did go wrong, even though we're not allowed to, you know, be in live panels, but you are allowed to troubleshoot on low voltage end. So there's now there's two guys per shift up here. Um, and we basically take care of when we're on, we, the whole plan is ours. You know, anywhere from, you know, the raw material coming into the melters all the way to where it's getting packed out and shipped out. Every piece of equipment. Yeah, another advantage of having everybody be dual trade. So like Sean said, he has somebody else on shift with him. Usually there's two people per shift up in plate and everywhere else in the plant, it's always a finger pointing game. If something breaks, all the electricians say it's mechanical and you need to call them. And all the mechanical people say it's electrical, you need to call them and nobody wants to go fix it. They all just want to say it's the other person. But when you're dual trading, you have training in both. If you have a, a motor that's like tripping the overload, if you're an electrician, you're only going to look at electrical causes because that's all you know. But if you're dual trading, you're like, oh, well, the thing's overloaded or the brakes on. That's why, you know what I mean? Like, or the chain is bound up on the sprocket. It's not electrical. Like the electrical is tripping, but that's not what the root cause is. It's, it's a mechanical issue. Um, and it's it's nice to have both backgrounds so it makes it quicker and easier to figure out what the problem is and fix it if you if you're familiar with how these things operate if all you know is electrical then that's all you're going to know to look for you know and same with mechanical if you don't understand anything about the electrical part you'll assume every problem that you can't figure out real quick you'll assume is electrical if you don't know electrical you know um so there's a lot of finger pointing that happens but up there it's like you're it <laughs> whatever whatever the problem is you're figuring it out and it's on you to fix it or order parts or lock it out or whatever you need to do. You're not, you can't pass the buck off to somebody else. You have to figure it out yourself. Um, so I think some of the, well, I guess I'll, I'll ask if anybody else has any questions so far. Um, I had a couple things written down that I figured people would want to ask, but I'll open it up to you guys. I know a couple of you guys are interested in um, internships and I have at least one sophomore that's interviewing for a full-time position. So yeah. does anybody have any questions for Sean before I move on to that. Were there any specific machines that were harder to work with than others? Um, actually, not really. It, it, in my opinion, it's it's once you understand a certain, like especially like the programming. Once once you can troubleshoot ten rungs of logic, you can troubleshoot a thousand rungs of logic. It, 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 that's how my mind works because once you know how to navigate through a, a software program. Um, do a search function. Okay. I need this output. It, it, once you learn how to do, you know, 10 rungs of logic, it doesn't matter how big the a piece of equipment is to troubleshoot. Um, a lot of, a lot of the, the stuff, as far as I, I would say, not harder to work on, but uh, I would say more annoying to work on is just an, an environmental factor. Like in our cast house, you know, uh, we have our casters that, that make the plate, you know, in the summertime, you know, it, it could be a 90 degrees outside, 95 degrees outside. Well, I guarantee you in our cast house, it's probably 105 degrees and, and it gets it, you know, you got molten metal flowing all the time. It's the heat and the environment that sometimes, you know, is, is the biggest distractor, I think. And the it's not too. To more, it's more annoying. It's not really harder to work on. It's just, just more annoying if that makes sense. Yeah. The, and, oh, go ahead. Are there, uh, it's kind of a weird question, but are there any times where the environment kind of helps you um, kind of deal with a certain machine or not really, not so much? Not really, not so much. Unless it's outside, unless you're, you're doing something outside. Yeah. I was going to say, we pulled, we pulled a motor the other weekend. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. 
uh, the other week we were pulling a motor outside and it was like, you know, 10 degrees outside. That's when, yeah, you wish it was summertime when you're pulling that motor. You know what I mean? Right, right, that's yeah. Time where we make a difference. That's what I was going to say. When you're working outside, like on the roof, because you you have to do all the facility stuff for the most part, too. If there's roofs leaking, you're up on the roof. But, you know, you're doing yeah. all kinds of stuff. You're all over the place. You're inspecting all the fire extinguishers. You're doing crane PMs. You're like working on literally everything in the plant is going to be yours if you work in plate. And sometimes you're outside and it's freezing cold and you're like, and then you get a call that you need to go to the cast house or go look at a cast. And you're like, oh, that's great. Cause it's freezing cold out here. And I know it's like 90 degrees right, right now. Yeah. Yesterday, you go in there and warm up or you're working on something. Yes. Um, but yeah, there's, yeah. Like Sean said, the environment is uh, difficult to work in sometimes. And there's like refractory dust. Refractory is the kind of material that um, can handle really high temperatures and like molten molten metals and things like that and not have a adverse reaction so it used to be like asbestos was used for things like that but they're oh great yeah That's... real fine and it's real bad to breathe and there's all these warnings all over the bags on it and all that so sometimes um you'll catch like a light beam going through the cast house usually the cast house down below is a lot worse you'll catch a light beam going through there and you'll just see like all the stuff floating in the air and you're like oh man it's i can't believe i'm, I'm in this room but yeah, usually yeah. it's not not normally an issue though but i mean you also um sean you also do like plumbing and pipe fitting and things like that right oh, yeah, yeah. Condo bending, plumbing pipe fitting uh all that stuff we do as well yeah we're running running lines i mean uh when we're installing new equipment you're you're doing all that running conduit um you're modifying equipment changing airlines around all, all that stuff you know it at, at, and you know if, if you like to learn a lot and it's constantly that's one thing i like to like about this place is is that you, you you have the opportunity to constantly learn about different things and that that's one thing i I've, I've always strived for in my just my general life it's just constantly learning about something i mean we have training classes just about anything you go down at the sheet mill in our training facility and you know how to bend conduit plumbing pipe fitting welding everything you can think of we do yeah, yeah, never, I learned never too plumbing. boring. No, oh, go ahead, you go ahead. You're... Oh, I, I just said I learned all my welding there. I did like uh, some stick welding before I started there, but when I was in mechanical maintenance to get promoted, you had to go to all these different training classes to get like your higher pay grades. So I spent weeks just at a welding table doing TIG welding and MIG welding and stick welding, <laughs> all these different types of welding that I had never done before mostly because a TIG welder is super expensive. So of course I didn't have like a couple thousand dollar TIG welder at home, but there, and it was like unlimited materials. Like here, keep practicing this until you can do it. Um, and you got pretty good at it by the time you left too. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I feel like I'm a pretty good welder now, but I learned like everything I know about welding pretty much at uh, Arconic. And I also learned a whole lot about PLCs. So they have a lot of GE PLCs and we do Allen Bradley. So that won't be new to you. But if you went there, you'd have to learn GE PLCs. So when I got the job up at Plate, I had all these required trainings that I had to go to. Um, they didn't expect me to know how to do everything. They trained me on all the equipment that they had there, like how the, how the GE software works and how to go online and how to look at the rungs in GE. It's the same standard ladder symbols that we're used to, like a normally open or normally closed or output coil and all that, but it's a whole different software package. So it's different like connections and all that. Um, right. So you're not going to be, if you went there, they wouldn't expect that you would just be an expert at all these things. You're going to go to, like, you. I had to go to uh, pneumatics and hydraulics classes and get certified by the Fluid Power Society. So if you want to talk about, like, those levels that you had to go through a little bit, Sean. Yeah, um, that, now that's, that's been a long, that's been 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> but yeah, we had, uh, at the time, what's that? Yeah. They still do it now, though, right? Just you haven't done it. It's inside. It's in house now that we do the training for hydraulics and pneumatics. Um, we have uh, one of our techs that teach the class. But years ago, we actually had Fluid Power Society come in, and uh, they taught the class. And you could go to level one pneumatics, level one hydraulics, and you could. I went all the way. You can go all the way up to tech, technician level uh, hydraulics and new mechanics, and they would actually pay for your membership to Fluid Power Society. Um, but at, at, after the downturn of 2008, we basically we brought it all in, in house, but we will teach you hydraulics and pneumatics. And it's, it's at the same level that, that you would get with Fluid Power Society. No doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. Most of that is math, figuring how to do math, figuring out all the formula, what formula you need to, to determine what for temperature compensation, for cylinder diameter, uh, volumes, flows. And it's all math. You know, if you can figure out how to do math, you, you're good to go. That's the hardest part of it. Yep. And I'm guessing you kind of, do you get paid to do that 
training? Um, if if you're there working yet, yeah, if it's a lot of time, it's okay. during your normal scheduled work hours, and you'll go down for training, and yeah, you'll be getting paid for that. And if they schedule it on your days off, depending on what where you are on your rotation, it's time to get. You might get overtime, time and a half for training. Uh, I know years ago the way we had it did it uh, on my days off, you could you could always sign up for training on your days off and come in, and typically you got paid time and a half to do it. So you're getting, you're bettering yourself and getting made more money to do it. So it's a win-win the way I look at it. Yeah. So Sean, speaking to that, when you say time in half, um, what do you think the low end for pay is? I know years ago when they had interns in mechanical maintenance, I think they're making 20 bucks an hour, but what's, what's the low in maintenance? What's the lowest grade that they hire in three? I'm trying to remember how it goes. If it goes high to low or low to high. The lower pay is, is the higher grade. In other words, uh, we, we go from grade seven to grade one. Grade seven is like around 28 bucks an hour. Grade one is a little over $40 an hour. So if you think, you know, you're making 30 bucks an hour and you come in time and half, so you're making 45 bucks an hour to learn GE PLCs, you know what I mean? And it's not like a high pressure environment. It's not like there's going to be, you know, exams and you're going to get fired if you don't pass it or whatever you know it's like it don't um, happen yeah it's more like a learning a learning thing um so yeah the the pay rates are like sean said like 28 and up 26 and up something like that and it, i i thought i remembered that they started at a higher grade level like maintenance nobody was like a grade eight or a grade nine in maintenance it was all like higher yeah, it, it, for the last couple of years, uh, like I, I have a guy that I'm training now that's on crew with me. He's been on me for the last year and a half. He's a graduate of Stevens. I think he graduated like two three years ago, I believe. Um, and uh, I, th he came in as a grade five. So that's like 31, maybe $32 an hour or something like that. 32, maybe something like that. Um, and yeah, he's only been here like a year and a half. And also but, with yeah. overtime, do you get, is Sunday time and half? I'm trying to remember how that worked. Saturday, oh, straight, not, Saturday is straight time and Sunday is time and a half. Is that how it works? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay. So two Sundays a month, you'll be scheduled, right? You'll have right. one night shift, one day shift. So at least yep. at least two days out of the month, you'll have a 12 hour shift that's all time and half too. Um, yeah, and, and if you're not, if you're new to all this terminology, time and a half means um, 1.5% or your times whatever your normal pay is so if you make 30 bucks an hour half of that's 15 so you'd make your normal 30 plus 15 so you make 45 bucks an hour um so at least two days and i remember doing tons of overtime when i was there too um whenever i felt like it basically i could come in on overtime and work on a project so it's not like you're gonna you know money's not going to be a big issue especially at you most of you guys ages um this will by far be the highest paying job that you've probably probably ever had um and you can get lots of overtime. So the other big sticking point that people have issues with is the shift. So I don't know if you want to talk about the shift. Some people just can't do it. Um, they're not built built to be able to function that way. Yeah. That, that, that is absolutely true. Some people just cannot handle the shift we work. Typically, we have a, a four-week rotation is what we have for a shift schedule. Um, I'll come in on a night shift. It is the start of the shift rotation. I'll work Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, night shift. I get off Saturday morning. I'm off Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Then I go back in daylight, Tuesday daylight, Wednesday daylight, Thursday daylight. Then I'm off Friday. I go back in on night shifts, Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night. And I'll get off Tuesday morning. Then I'm off Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then I'll work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And then you have seven days off straight. So that's what I'm doing right now. Like today I'm working daylight, Monday, and then I'll be off for the next seven days. So it, once you get your vacation, I mean, you, you think about it. Once you get here, you know, you're, you're here a bunch of years. We, you get three weeks of vacation after uh, um, five years, four weeks after 10 years, and uh, five weeks after 15 years. Now, you, if you add that on with your week off a month, I mean, you're getting 18 weeks off a year and still making close to six figures, or if not more than six figures. <laughs> And you're also, you have a bunch of paid holidays. I don't remember how many it is, like 11 paid holidays? 10, 10 paid holidays and two personal holidays. Yeah. Like personal holidays, the days you can just take So them. once you've been there as long as Sean, you're only working like six months out of the year. Um, 
for in, like Sean, for instance, always takes off like the whole month of hunting season. <laughs> like when hunting season comes around, he's just gone for that like quarter of the year. Seems like um, yeah, every year, I do eight weeks during archery season because I'm a big archery hunter. What, what do you take? Eight weeks. Eight. I'm off eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So took, he's off two months. Month, two months for hunting season. <laughs> Most people are open to get the first day of rifle off from their work, and Sean takes uh, almost that whole quarter of the year off. <laughs> that's why i've got a couple hundred deer <laughs> yeah well yeah he needs that kind of time yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I, it looks like sarah has a question you got a question sarah i do sorry just about the scheduling how do they do overtime to cover vacation is it uh forced is it voluntary how does uh, that structure here, work up here where i work we don't force it in other words we'll have the extra person on there's two people on crew and if one of the people go up two of both of them can't go off on vacation at the same time. But if, uh, if you know, that one person goes off, the other person's there to cover the crew and you just cover the crew by yourself. I mean, you, you can, it's it, it, maybe if, it, if you've got a lot of breakdowns, you might be running around a lot, but if you don't have a lot of breakdowns, you can, you can, it's one person can handle the whole plant or the whole department by themselves. So we, we really, I've, I've been here for 25 years and I've never been forced to work overtime. Typically, the production people, yeah, the production people get forced overtime a lot. I mean, a lot, but usually maintenance, uh, maintenance don't typically get forced on overtime. Not the not not up here at least. Very rarely down the sheet mill as well. You know when I remember somebody getting forced for overtime was when Dave Weston's band was going to play. You remember uh, that? And he yeah, got seven. forced to come in and work when his band was supposed to play, and he was so pissed he was trying to get out of it. Um, Speaking of, um, what kind of things, what are you looking for in a new guy starting out and what kind of things can get you in trouble? Speaking of Dave Weston. <laughs> um, yeah. Some of the things that uh, you, safety is, is the main priority, plain and simple. Um, whatever safety rules that you read, you follow every safety rule to the T. I mean, if it takes you, I mean, you're getting paid by the hour and you're getting paid to be safe. So if, if, yeah, if that 10 minute job takes you two hours because you got to lock things out and do it, that's there. They want you to be safe. So safety is the main thing. Don't do anything unsafe. Always follow all the safety rules that and show up to work. Yeah. Show up to work. That that's, that's the main thing. Attendance. I mean, uh, uh, is, is a big thing, uh, coming in late, stuff like that. They, they, they've, I've, they've fired more people than that over the years than anything else I've can see. If, if you're here every day, and you follow all the safety rules and just basically keep your nose clean. It, yeah. It's all but impossible to get fired from this place, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that being like real odd to me when I started down in uh, sheet and mechanical maintenance that they had like specific gloves for specific types of jobs. Like you need cut proof gloves to do this. You need this kind of gloves for this. And I remember because you had to go to the storeroom, which wasn't anywhere near where I was working. And I was like, I don't got time for that. And they're like, no, no, it doesn't matter how much time it takes. It's way more important that you go, if it takes you an hour to go get these gloves and you're walking slow the whole way, nobody's going to care. They're going to care that you have the right gloves. They're not going to care how fast it takes to get this job done. Like that was way more important. I thought that was like, that was like mind blowing at the time. I'm like, really, you guys don't care if I just like screw off for an hour to go get these gloves as long as I have the right gloves. And that, yeah, that was basically the situation. Um, yeah. So I'm trying, I'm thinking like the last three people now it makes it sound like a lot of people get fired from plate, but I was just talking to Sean yesterday and at least three people that I used to work with there don't work there anymore. And I guess two were safety and one was, uh, attendance, right? Yeah. Yeah. Attendance. Yep. Yeah. And I remember somebody lockout tag out down in general maintenance, somebody that was there for a long time. I remember if it was 15 or 20 years, they were there and they didn't do the lockout. Right. And they took a lock or they left a key for a lock uh, land somewhere on a desk or whatever, and they weren't supposed to, they're supposed to hand it off physically to somebody else and they got fired for that. So lock, you know, safety, and they're always real big on lost work time incidents and recordable incidents. So I don't know yeah. when you guys did your OSHA cards, if they talked about lost work time or uh, recordable incidents, recordables are, is a big like buzzword you'll hear in the industry a lot about um, uh, an, an incident that was bad enough that they had to do paperwork on it basically. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they, they always want to avoid those. And I was telling them, um, a little bit, I think it was this group that I was talking to about sometimes what a pain it seems like, like if you have to move something with a crane three feet, 
You got to do a crane inspection form. You have to do a strap inspection form. You have to do a, a pre-task job sheet for just moving this thing. Something that would literally take you like 30 seconds to do. Sometimes you have to do 15 minutes of paperwork before you can do that thing. And that's what that's what you do. That I mean, if you move it without doing all that paperwork, you're potentially getting yourself in trouble if somebody catches you and you get paid by the hour and nobody's going to tell you not to do the paperwork. So it's like, it's not intuitive. Like if you're motivated and you want to get the job done, you want to just go do it. That's not, that's not the attitude you're supposed to have. You're supposed to do all the paperwork and do everything in the right order and what you're supposed to do. Um, so when you have a new guy starting out, what are the things that you see in people or would like to have in people when they start out? Like how could some, if one of these guys wanted to come up and work and play with you and they were craning on your ship with you, what would, what would you like to see in them and what would be impressive to you and then like their work ethic and their knowledge and abilities and all that work ethic, asking questions and, and seem like they're interested. If that makes sense, just the interested in what's going on, why is it going on, you know, and just going to watch the equipment. Hey, how's, how does this work? The, the, you know, a natural uh, question of things, if, if that makes sense. Um, and, and a good work ethic, Show, showing up every day and just, you know, when something goes down, breaks or goes down, go there in a timely manner. You know what I mean? They're, we've had people come here and, you know, equipment's down and they're still sitting back at the desk staring at a phone or something like that. It's like the equipment's down and it's your job to get it back up and run and fix it. It's not, now's the time. There's plenty of time that you can goof off, trust me. But there's when something's broken and down, that's the time to do something. That's the time to have some work. I think go get it done fixed. Then you can go back to, you know, if you're there, if all your priority lists, I mean, we have, we have like a work list basically that we have a certain work that we have to get done on a shift and, you know, nothing in here is backbreaking work. I mean, there's, there's times where we can get that work list done in two hours and we're here for 12 hours. You know, there's, you know, Dan knows more than anybody about government work. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, work ethic is that when you have a piece of equipment down, be willing to get up and go and tackle that piece of equipment to get it back up and running. So Sean, I have to make it a, I have to uh, admit something to you. I was saying to these guys the other day about how much downtime I had when I was at Iconic. And I was saying that if none of the machines are down and you have your list done and you've already done your rounds, there's literally nothing for you to work on, but you're still there. Like if you're on your four nights over the weekend, you're there for what, 48 hours in a four day period. And sometimes yeah. you can get your whole work list done on that Friday. So you have three days. And if everything's running smooth and nothing breaks, you got lots of time and you got a full shop full of like nice equipment and tools and raw materials. That you can do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Learning. Like he, he said about welding, he, he took the time. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I'm talking about initiative. Dan's a good example of it. When he was, he had downtime, he took the initiative to A, break a book open and learn something or go practice welding or, or whatever it is he wanted to do. That's a, he's a, he's a good example of that. Um, that's what I'm talking about, what we're, what we're looking for. So, um, so there's other people, I don't want to drop any names like Maurice, um, <laughs> that when, when things break down and you're working on the ship when it's just you and one other person and you need help and everything's going to hell real quick, uh, they're in the bathroom. They're in the bathroom for an hour. <laughs> and then after everything's fixed, oh, they show back up. Oh, hello. Nice to see you. So, yeah. That's, well, that's, that's kind of, you don't want to be that guy. <laughs> Yeah, that guy got me today. That's why we had to mill down for, for five hours a day. Bathroom? No, he didn't feel comfortable welding a tank. Well, was <laughs> the tank full of something flammable or? No, there's nothing in it. It was a little air tank on that, a flipper in, a, in the stacker, you know, mill three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It grind it and weld it. But, you know, the time you get all the fire curtains out and stuff like that, it's like, yeah, just didn't feel like dragging everything out. But, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. That's another, that's another example of the safety stuff. If you're going to weld something, you can't just get out a welder and weld it. You need like fireproof blankets. You need to do like a fire check sheet, a welding check sheet beforehand. You need to have, yeah, you need to have a fire extinguisher there with you. You need to have somebody that stays there after the welding job is done for a specified amount of time called a fire watch. Is it 30 minutes or an hour? 30 um, minutes after you get done welding. Yeah. So at some times you'll just be standing there leaning on a fire extinguisher, waiting for a half an hour for the time to be up so you can pick up all the blankets. So there's there's lots of if you walk into that place and you're not familiar with it, you would think, 
holy shit, this place looks dangerous. There's mobile equipment flying around everywhere and there's cranes moving big, heavy pieces of things that look like they're about to fall off any second because they're just picked up by vacuum. And there's lots of stuff going on. There's lots of moving parts. You would think it was dangerous, but then when you actually start working there, you realize how much paperwork and how much safety regulations you're required to do. How, um, there, you, I mean, how many different uniforms do you have, Sean, depending on what type of material you're doing, if you're welding, if you're around molten metal, if you're around electricity, I mean, yeah. Yeah, we have uh, like depending on the voltage of electricity, we is you know, your arc flash clothing you're going to have to wear before you throw a disconnect. Um, if you're welding, you can't be wearing Vinex. You have to have to wear a cotton uniform or a wool uniform when you're welding. So yeah, that that all that has to be taken in, into consideration before you do a task of, of any type. Like mm -hmm. I said, the safety is the main main thing you have to worry about when you're here because there is a lot of stuff that can hurt you and can kill you right quick uh, moving around in here. Now, Dan, I don't know if I told you yesterday about how our schedule, I just told about how maintenance schedule works up here. Production is no longer on our schedule up here. Oh. I don't know if I told you. Production works Monday through Friday, and that's it. So Saturday and Sundays when we're here, there is no production in here. It's just two good maintenance guys and one production person doing fire watch, and that's it. Oh, geez. <laughs> so nothing's getting done on the weekends then, huh? Well, stuff. That's, that's when all the stuff should be getting done because everything's down. That's when you're doing your bed leveling and stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you guys didn't have to level the beds on the jelly box printers, right? They just get zip tied down. There's no adjustment on those beds. On yeah. what? Oh. Um, I'm asking them. We have 3D printers in the classroom um, that have like a Y axis that runs on rails that are kind of like the mills. Because I was going to okay. try to explain them what bed leveling is like. And on other 3D printers, you do have to try to level the bed to the head. And it's kind of similar to the way the mills work. Um, so they have giant milling machines in plate. Um, and the, what's the diameter on the cutter head on those things? Uh, the, the one, two, and three, the, the diameter is five and a half feet. And mill four is nine feet. And mill four is uh, the cutter head's 9,000 pounds. And the cutter heads on the other two mills are 4,000 pounds. And they're turning at about 500 RPM. Yeah, so I don't know if you can imagine what that looks like, but if you think of like those CNC routers kind of that you would see, except it's giant and the whole frame is like cast iron and it was probably made by like the Army Corps of Engineers or something like 50 years ago. Um, we, yeah, there's four of those. And so the whole bed moves back and forth like this and you have to level the rails that it rides on and you use a uh, laser, um, what's that called? It starts with a T track we have trackball lasers now is what we're using you ought to see our laser system that we have now and it's not like the when you were here it's really nice there's no you just move the head i mean and just move it around just touch places and it'll automatically pick up and you it it cuts the time in half compared to when me and you did bed leveling you still got to move stuff you know you still got to do the grunt work like when you we and you did it but yeah it, it cuts the time that the the readings down in half it, it's just called a trackball laser right now it's what they are so so that's like another thing. There's there's so much stuff. There's so many different aspects of that job that I don't even remember half of them. But you'll do like laser bed alignment and like all all kinds of different things. You'll do welding. You're working with lasers. You're working with PLC logic. You're working with um, molten metal burners. Like Sean's specialty is doing uh, yeah doing the combustion in the burners, which is runs on natural gas, and that's all PLC controlled. That's a whole another field. So I had to go down and do like a combustion initial like intro to combustion classes just because i was working up there which is all stuff that i had never dealt with before in my life so if you want to go somewhere where you're just going to be kind of like phoning it in and you're not planning on doing a lot of learning and putting a lot of effort for it this probably is not the place because there's so many different aspects to this job you're always going to be doing something new and have to learn something new but yeah my uh my admission that i was going to make to you earlier was i was telling these guys how i had like tons of downtime and had tons of time, like especially over our weekends where it might have like three days straight, like 36 hours you're there in the plant um, and you can just work on whatever you want to work on. Basically, if you have all your work done, if you're all caught up and there's no breakdowns. Um, so I had one of the students say that they did decided that they weren't interested in working there because it didn't sound like they would learn much because of what I said. And then I felt bad about it. I'm like, well, that, that's not the case at all. So I'm glad yeah. that you mentioned a lot of that stuff. Um, it's you have unlimited ability to learn all kinds of things. And if you wanted to go to somebody else's department of the plant and ask them questions, they would be more than happy to tell you all about what they do, where they're at too. 
Um, yeah. Like even like cranes, you'll probably have to go to a class on just cranes, um, overhead cranes, gantry cranes, all the controls, the drives, if it's a vector drive on the crane, all you know, how to measure the crane hook and the deflection and how to measure the cables. Changing cables on a crane is a whole, yeah. it's whole, its own That's art. <laughs> just changing, <laughs> changing. There's like, I mean, you might be doing lasers, you might be doing combustion, and this is all in the same facility and it's just you and one other person doing all this stuff. Well, per crew, yeah, there's eight eight guys total, but yeah. and there's two guys that are on daylight all the time. Um, but yeah, there's eight guys total. I mean, when you go back to like the, the mill beds and leveling them, um, it's try to imagine a bed that's 40 feet long. And me and Dan used to get it within a half thou all the way down in 40 feet. Yeah. That's how accurate that we needed it to be. Yeah. So that's a half a thousandth of an inch from one end to the other 40 feet apart. Um, yeah. And two, two rails that are parallel. So you have to get them in parallel too. Um, because that's what they rough cast the plate um, and then they put it on this bed and suck it down with vacuum and they have this uh, milling uh, cutter head that comes across and cuts it all perfectly flat and then flip it and cut it the other side so you get it right to the exact spec that you need and those are all controlled those are cnc controlled and the operators always have issues where you got to come out and type in the codes and make adjustments on the controller for those super old machines i don't even remember what the controller scheme that is on those, but it's not like, are, are those Fanic controls? I don't even remember. Ephonic right now. And th those machines, mill one, two, and three were built during World War II. That's what, that's that's their date code on them. They were all built during World War II. Um, okay. But of course the controls were updated and stuff, but it's GE Phonic is what's run that CNC. Yeah, so that's, that's a whole nother control scheme that you're not gonna see anywhere else except there. So nobody's going to expect that you you're going to come in and be an expert in all these different things it's just not even possible um you're not going to come in with bed leveling experience from somewhere else like there's not really anywhere else that does this kind of work um and if you want to talk a little bit about how secretive the plate mill was when it first started out about how you had to keep the garage doors and down and all that um yeah, we're the only we were at the time uh when we were alumax at the time uh we were the only place in the world casting plate like it is and it was so secretive that we, when the sheet facility was letting out at the end of shift, we had to shut our doors so even the sheet facility employees couldn't see what we were doing. That's yeah. how secret it was. And all the garage doors had to stay down. So in case anybody was over on the other side of the berm from 272 with binoculars trying to see how they're doing it. Yep. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive the way it works. And when, I think it was Adam asked, um, like are any machines easier or harder to work on? Um, without being in the plant, it's hard to understand that all these machines were just made for this purpose. They're, these aren't like off the shelf machines. Um, was built. Yeah, like all the casters were designed and built for this and they don't have them anywhere else. So it's, it's not like, um, you know, I like working on a milling machine. Even the milling machines are like all purpose built just for this. Um, so it's not like you're going to have experience on one of these. You're not going to come in knowing all about casters because they, they don't exist anywhere else. This is the only place you're ever going to see them. So you got to do all the one on the job training and you look at it and be like, wow, there's one chain that goes the whole way through this whole thing on all these different sprockets that keeps everything running in sync. And there's a, a belt. I'm trying to think what the belt's made out of. What's a belt made out of? It's a graphite belt. Yeah. And there's only like one place that makes these belts, right? That you got to order them from. It's a hundred has a hundred year old loom. Actually, it's over a hundred year old now loom that makes the belts that actually cast the plate. Yeah, um, so there's even, one guy that you can get them from. <laughs> even back to the milling machines. Yeah, we have we have four milling machines, but uh, you know that do the same thing. They're both all cutting the plate, but they're all four of those mills are different. They're not all the same. So each one's going to have its own quirk, its own little uh, you know components are a little different. Um, so you, you basically have to learn all all four of the mills as well. Um, but like I said, you know, we'll, we don't expect anybody to know that much when they come in here. We'll, we'll teach you. And you can use this anywhere. That's the thing. Once you get learn this stuff, you know, it's all aspects of industries, you know, that you can use this kind of knowledge, combustion stuff, PLC. Um, you can take that anywhere. I was even just thinking about like vacuum. Like if you, if you never done anything with vacuum, there's tons of vacuum lifts. There's vacuums on the mill that suck the plate down. Um, so there's compressed air, there's vacuum, there's um, hazardous gases. So there's a uh, chlorine gas that gets put in um, and that's all piped usually with like stainless tubing. Um, so you might be bending stainless tubing or, use, or um, 
clamping like AN fittings or cutting threads on pipe. There's like pretty much anything that you would do in industry. There's an opportunity to do it, you know, a little bit in the plate mill. Um, yeah. Even like water water treatment stuff or like the bag house environmental control stuff. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, I, I'm bringing all this up now because I felt real bad when uh, the one person said, oh, it sounds like you wouldn't learn anything if you went there. I'm like, oh, it's, it's actually the exact opposite. Um, yeah. And I realized that was that was all my fault for saying that. But um, So I think I got everything covered. We talked about the shift. We talked about the pay. We talked about what you got to do to uh, keep your job, which is really pretty easy. There's people that really abuse the system that have been there for a long time. Um, yeah, you have to really try hard to uh, to mess up there. Um, and what you're looking for, which is basically just somebody that's willing to learn and somebody that's willing to try hard. Um, yeah. And I mean, you have a couple people, there's only eight, eight people in plate. Um, you have a couple people now that are just like starting out that know like very little about any of it, right? Yeah, we do actually on one or other crew, they, they are starting out and they, they have no electrical experience whatsoever. And, um, but they come in and they know that we can teach them up here and that's, what's going to happen. We're going to teach them electrical. We have a couple of different electrical classes down below. We, I don't know, you probably went to them, Dan Mag one, AC motors, yep. um, we'll put them through that. And then, uh, a lot of on the job training, you know, standing behind them and, you know, being patient with them and showing them how, what, how to do things. Um, I know we're going to be losing a couple people here in, in the next couple of weeks. I have a feeling they, they, they put in for a bids for you know, technical, technical jobs down below um, that are all daylight. And, and if that's what, you know, some people, like I said, ain't are not cut out to do shift work, working night shift and doing swing shift. And that's understandable. I mean, once, once you're here for a couple of months, you'll realize real quick whether you can do it or whether you can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. I drank a ton of coffee. That's how I got it. Um, one of the other odd things is like, I remember um, when John was there, he would ask me like, oh, you've never done that before? Like, like a, a specific job in the plant somewhere. You you, re, you mean you've never done that before? And I would say, well, it's never broke since I've been here. So I've never had to, like almost everything that you learn in the plate mill is when something goes down and breaks and you're working with somebody that knows what they're doing and you're figuring out how to fix it. If it's just sitting there running on its own for months and months and months, there's really, you're never going to shut it down and tear it apart. Just for the sake of it to figure it out you know what i mean so almost everything you're going to learn there is going to be on the job training when something goes down you got to repair it or you're doing a pm or you're doing a rebuild um, right yeah so i mean it's not expected that you're going to know um yeah you said the the one girl that started there had wasn't even in maintenance right no she's a machinist mate in the reserve navy reserves um and that's how she got in the door well her dad works down below too but um, yeah, that's how she got in the door. Yeah. But, so. uh, but you know, she's, she's pretty smart. I mean, I give mm -hmm. her that. You, usually you just show her one time and she's, she's got it. So uh, unfortunately she's on the crew at Maury. So, yeah. <laughs> so she better get it. She better pick it up quick. She's going to have a lot of slack she, to pick up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He ain't going to be showing her. So <laughs> yeah. He's got three on himself. Or something. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So does anybody have, uh, we're like five minutes over. Most people are still here, so that's good. Uh, does anybody else have any more questions for Sean about, about anything in general or a specific Darkonic or anything like that? Um, are there any specific dates that we should know if we are interested in an internship? internship? Um, that I do not know. I, that That's something like our HR people would be able to be able to tell you or something like that. I mean, um, I, I have, I don't have any affiliation with them down there as far as when they're going to be hiring interns or, or when they're going to be hiring employees. Uh, I know, I know they're on a big hiring spree right now. They're, they're, especially for production and they're, they're bringing people left and right in here right now. We're, we're ramping up. Uh, they want to do almost a hundred million pounds more next year than they did. Usually we do like 500 million pounds a year and they want to dump bump it up to 600 this year. Um, we are busy, so busy right now. <laughs> So, so I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. And to your point, Adam, uh, Lori Grove gets contact from HR at Arconic. And she sent me out one saying that they're going to hire four or six interns. And Sean, I don't think we ever had an intern up in plate though, right? We have in the past. We have had interns in the past from Stevens. Um, actually, uh, a guy, Andrew Rainier, he, uh, he, was, he got a job here. He worked here for like eight years. Now he's over at uh, Safe Harbor Dam. 
So he, he was an, in, he started off as intern years ago. We up uh, plate used to get all kinds of interns, but. Oh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll talk to your HR and try to tell them to get one for plate. Yeah. That'd be, be nice. Yeah. And typically when you're intern here, uh, you're not allowed to do anything when you're an intern base. <laughs> now it's true. You're just basically watching your hands off. You know, you're, you're just watching what we do and learning. Yeah. I wanted to make that point. I think I told all these guys that, that a couple of times because I'm worried that they'll think that a lot is going to be expected of them. And it's the exact opposite. You're like, you're literally not even allowed to touch anything. <laughs> yeah. Literally not allowed to touch anything. Yeah. Um, and I, I wanted to bring that up to you too. So last summer, I don't know if this is a touchy subject and it's probably not uh, um, something I think it's important for these guys to hear. And also, I don't know the answer. Um, last summer, they were talking about laying people off. They're cutting everybody's hours back. And you said now in your plant, they're only working Monday through Friday on production. And they were they didn't take any interns last summer and they weren't hiring anybody. And now out of the blue, it seems like they need a ton of people. Now it's a big emergency. Like what, what's going on? I, and they were doing, um, what do you, what's that word um, where they let people take like leaves of absence and then they close the, the plant for a little while. And like, if I knew that and I was talking about putting in for a job there, I'd be worried. Like, how do I know that's not going to happen six months from now? Well, that, that was a direct result of COVID. All the auto dealers uh, slowed down and, and stopped produ producing. So they would, we sell, we, a lot of our aluminum, especially sheet mill goes to the automakers. And when Ford they trucks, back, right? huh? Ford, Ford trucks, trucks and radiators, right? A lot of them, Toyota, uh, a lot of them, Airstream, Airstream uh, trailers. Uh, that's one of our big ones down there too. All that stopped. And when that stopped, it took like about a month. And then we basically, they basically came to a crawl. However, play facility, we didn't. We've been, we were busy all of 2020 because like I said, our aluminum was going overseas to build uh, these uh, ventilators. Mm -hmm. So they changed, they actually changed our the schedule around to this, this shift two, three years ago for production. Maintenance, our schedules never changed. I didn't miss one day of work last year whatsoever at Plate Facility. And uh, production, I think the they got cut back to 36 hours over two weeks in the summer, and then they went right back to 48 hours a week. And now they've been doing 60 hours a week for months. Um, and because we, it really didn't, it, the, basically as coronavirus didn't impact the Plate Facility hardly at all. Yeah. We, we were been busy. And that's an important differentiation between maintenance and production they're like two separate worlds so there's certain Literally. rules for production and certain rules for maintenance and there's certain schedules and hours for production and certain schedules and hours for maintenance um so you'll hear like if you talk to somebody who works at arconic they might complain a lot about tons of forced overtime and like yeah you got a week off but then they force you to work three or four days of your week off and all that that's not maintenance that's production production does get forced tons of overtime whether they want it or not um, right but yeah maintenance isn't isn't usually like that. Usually, uh, maintenance is a little more well respected and treated a little better than, than production people are. You know. I've worked a uh, one day of overtime in about two and a half years. So, I mean, I yeah, and he I'm... takes two months off for hunting, and <laughs> and he's out with an injury usually once a year. <laughs> no, I ain't. Oh come on! What was what was your last one? I just what do you hurt your leg or something? Twenty twelve. No. Oh. I, I, hit, I hit a deer on my motorcycle. That's the last one. I was Didn't you do a rotator cuff or something like a couple months ago? No, it's due. I haven't got, okay. I haven't done it. It's torn now, and I just haven't. I, I don't want to get a surgery, and I don't want to take off work. So I haven't done it. But yeah, last time I was out, I was out for a week when I hit the deer on my motorcycle. So. I would tell you just wrap that thing up with some duct tape, but I'm going to tell you go with Gorilla Tape. Have you tried that new uh, Gorilla brand duct tape? That stuff's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I see the glue's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Is that what happened? Yeah, they put the glue in her hair. hair. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, Adam, do you have any more questions? Sarah, do you have any questions? A lot, but I don't want to hold everybody up. So. Oh, Sean, do you have anywhere you got to be? No, I get paid by the hour. <laughs> uh, I'm go. good until three o'clock. And everybody else, the, the class ended at 2.15, so everybody's here on their own time. Um, so, yeah, Sarah, go ahead. Uh, you're not going to probably have too many opportunities, or anybody that wants to ask any questions, probably not going to have too many opportunities to ask somebody that's a current employee that's been there for a quarter of a century. 
and probably has all the answers to every question that you would have. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I could try. What are your, uh, what would you say are the best and worst things about working for Arconic? Uh, the best thing about working Arconic is the time off. To me, the worst thing about working Arconic is a wearing a hard hat. <laughs> I mean, that's just me. I hate it. Can't stand it. I've, I've hated it since day one. And but, Is it all day, every day? Well, when you're in an office, like right now, no. But when you're out on the floor, yes. And I, that's the, only, that's the thing that I hate the most is the hard hat. You I, know what blows, blows my mind about the hard hat rule is that you have to wear a hard hat when you're on the roof. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. oh, for, for meteors, I guess. <laughs> like, what's going to fall on your head if you're on the roof? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. But yeah, you have to wear safety glasses, hard hat, earplugs, um, special Metal shoes. Yeah, metatarsal safety boots. Um, yeah, spats, which are a covering over where the laces are on the front of your boots so that molten metal doesn't go through the tongue of your boot. Um, obviously, that would be a bad day. Yeah, that's a bad day. That's a bad day if you got molten metal splashing on your uh, splashing on your foot. But that's, that's just, just you have to, if you're down in a cast house, you have to wear that. And is all that supply to you? Yes, all that. out of pocket. Yep. Uh, safety boots are paid for. Everything's everything's supplied for you. Even your laundry for your uniforms. So you can't wash your uniforms in regular laundry detergent because it takes off the coating that's for like electrical or welding or whatever type of uniform it is. So there's a you change, there's a changing room. You put your normal clothes on and you throw your uniform in a hamper thing, and then they all get sent out and cleaned and they're in your locker all nicely pressed on a hanger ready to go so you don't even you don't have to wear ruin any of your own normal clothes you don't have to do any of your laundry or uniforms your hard hat safety glasses earplugs safety boots your spats everything um everything is all provided for you and you have a tool allowance what's the tool allowance now mm -hmm. uh, i think it's 130 dollars every six months yeah so what's that 260 dollars a year you'll get for tools yeah um every year so even after you have all your tools then you can just splurge yeah, plus plus our bonuses too we get bonuses every quarter yeah i forgot about that so on top of your normal pay and your overtime and your tool allowance you get quarterly bonuses which when i was there they it was kind of a moving target whatever the safety thing of the day whatever the safety du jour whatever they felt like making a big deal at the time they would say oh you got to hit all these marks for this this safety thing this quarter and if you did you would get a certain percentage bonus based on what your your pay was um and then they would seem like they changed it every quarter when i first started it was almost we we're getting it all the time like 7% bonuses and up and then they kind of made it a moving target so how do, well, how do they have it set up now Sean? now safety's not even involved in your target at all it's oh, man. On, on on clash on cash uh, flow or demand or something like that and there's a couple of corporate things that they look at um so it's all business uh, stuff that you don't really have any control over then right like i'll give you an example our our, our last uh bonus for first quarter of this year was like 11.4 percent oh nice and that's that's a that's 11.4 percent of what you made total in the first in that quarter before that so it's, if you made thirty five thousand dollars in the uh first that quarter you got a bonus of 11.5% of that. So that's what it was, but it can go anywhere from, I've seen it, you know, last summer when we were real slow and everything, it was down to like 2%. So it can get, it bounce all over the place, but I've average, I'd say average is probably about seven or 8% somewhere around there. Yeah. And that's just extra money above and beyond your normal pay. Hey. Yeah. Um, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, pay wise, everything looks good on paper until you get in there and you got to do uh, four 12s over Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And then you got to do that every month when all your buddies are out doing whatever. Um, and you got a 40, 48 hours of work you got to do this weekend. And it's a job in the cast house. It's super hot and you're filthy. And uh, that's when you start questioning your decisions. Um, before you actually work there and you see how much the pay is and you see the bonuses and all this other stuff and you see that everything's given to you for free and safety is really important, all that looks good. But when when it really hits the fan and you're the only person on shift and everything's broken down and everybody needs you all at the same time and it's 110 degrees in the cast house, that's when you're like, did I make the right choice to come here? You know? um, so you got to take the good with the bad. 
So, yeah. Yeah. All right. What else you got, Sarah? Okay. So every time I hear about Arconic, it's because like something very bad happened and somebody got hurt or killed. I mean, how much would you say of that is avoidable and somebody just did, was doing something they weren't supposed to do? Uh, almost all of them, somebody was doing something they weren't supposed to do. Um, I've Since I've been here, I only know one person that's been killed and he was not an Arconic employee. He was actually uh, an outside contractor that we hired to cut our grass. And unfortunately, I was here the day uh, that it happened. He flipped over a lawnmower on our one of our hills and it didn't have a kill switch on it. And the blade cut him in his femoral artery and he bled out. Um, and that's over the 25 years that I've been here. Now we've had, we've had some injuries. Um, yeah, we had a, an explosion uh, back in January in our cast house down, down at the sheet mill. Um, you, you can put, you can put uh, water on top of molten metal all day long and nothing will happen. If you put water under molten metal, you have a hydrogen bomb instantly. And they blew the whole back end of the cast house off and it blew the windows out of the forklift. And we're talking a 40,000 pound forklift. And the guy got second degree burns on his neck. It was just a little bit because he had all his protective equipment on. And that what, that's what saved his life. But I mean, a lot, and that's, that's because he put charge of sow that had snow on it and it went under water. He did something stupid that he did not follow procedures. Most things, if you follow procedures and put and follow all the safety things, you will not get hurt. That I know that for a fact, there's too many, too many things in effect that that'll protect you. But if you, people take, people are people, people, it's natural. People take shortcuts. You know, if I, it's going to take me five hours to do this job. If I follow the safety rules where I can go, you know, do it in 50 minutes and go back sitting in a desk and playing on my phone or doing something like that. And you take that route, well, you're going to have to take the risk of like, taking that route too. I mean, there's always consequences for doing stuff like that. That's the way I see it. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> or the other one that sticks out in my mind is the, uh, the press down below where they were bypassing the light curtains to stick their hands in the press his hand off yeah yeah so that that's a bad injury but there's literally light curtains with beams that shoot in front of the thing to keep the thing from operating if your arm sticks in there and they were bypassing their hand around the thing to try to get their hand in there while someone else was on the other side pressing a button to make it up like they had to try hard to make that happen yeah. and bypass multiple different safety issues uh, yeah. Yeah, if you do what you're supposed to do, um, there's not going to be an issue. And anytime there, Arconic is really good too. Anytime there is a safety uh, issue and there's a recordable, there is a whole team that's investigating it. Sometimes OSHA is even there investigating it. And now they have yeah. all these new procedures and all this new paperwork. So anytime they've ever had an incident where somebody had an issue that was something bad that happened, there's a, a swarm of people that are making sure that that same accident never happens again. Yeah, uh, there's, there's a lot rules that'll come if you have an accident and there's an investigation there's going to be a lot of rules and a lot of changes being placed even if there's somebody it was their fault they're still going to make it so it can't be their fault anymore if that you know they're they're going to human proof it or engineer it to where that can't happen again yeah so at this point that plant's been there so long pretty much all of the stupid mistakes people could make have been made at this point and have attempted to be engineered out or people have given more safety equipment to wear or more forms to check or whatever because they're running they've been running like 24 7 production for i don't know 40 years or something 50 years maybe longer than that 75 years yeah that was, was close <laughs> you know what's funny i remember the 70th anniversary i went to that 70th anniversary party they had so i know where i came up with 50 but yeah it's yeah. been a long long time before any of you guys long 50 years before most of you guys were alive there's been people in this plant doing these exact jobs so most of the things that can get you hurt or get you in trouble have already been found out by now um yeah. and attempted to be engineered out of the out of the system right um i'm trying to think thomas was it you somebody else had mentioned that they were interested in Arconic, and I try to remember who it was specifically and ask if they had any questions. Um, Adam, do you have any more? Sarah? I'm good. Thank you so much, though. Yep. You're welcome. Yeah, I can't really think of any questions, but it was very informative, um, everything we went over. And again, I, this is, I, yeah, go I ahead. I have one more. It's pretty simple. 
Uh, when you say operation, does that mean like operating roles, being an operator on the floor compared to maintenance? Yeah, when I say operators, these are the people that actually uh, that run the equipment that, you know, that are in control of the like a milling. You have a mill operator, you have a caster operator. Uh, they're the ones that are actually running the piece of equipment at the time. Now, maintenance don't have any does not have anything to do with uh, running the equipment or anything. And when they have a breakdown or if the equipment's not running properly like they want it to, that's when we get called in. But they, the operators, when I say operators, they're they're the ones running the equipment. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So, like when I talk about, I so I was telling Sean that I have this problem a lot. Like I use a lot of terminology that everybody that's in the manufacturing industry knows what I'm talking about, but you guys for the most part are straight out of high school and, and probably don't know a lot of the stuff that I say. So when I say uh, like a trouble call, like, or you get called out to a problem, um, I always forget that you guys don't just automatically know what that means. Um, so normally you'll be in your shop, you'll have your own maintenance shop that has all your equipment, all your tools, um, all like your calibrations and all your laptops for your PLCs and everything that you would need. Um, all your pipe fitting tools and your welders and all the stuff that is involved with your job. Um, you and whoever else you're on shift with will be in that shop. So in the beginning, when I was showing you on the map where the general maintenance shop is, that whole building is just mechanical maintenance people and their equipment and our lunch room and all that. And there's no production happening in there. There's no machines running. It's like its own separate area. Um, so you'll be in your own separate area. And then when the operators are like, hey, this machine's not running right, or this chain just broke or some, something electrical just arced and burn up or, you know, whenever they have a problem, they call you. It's uh, it's like the bat phone. You think of yourself as Batman. <laughs> the bat phone rings. Hey, we need maintenance down here. Uh, this caster is not running right or the belt's running real fast, but no plates coming out or, you know, whatever the problem is or the forklift. The, we ran something over with the forklift. That happens all the time. Somebody yep. bangs into something and destroys it with a forklift. Do we have another one of these? Can you change it? You know, that kind of thing. So you're not actually going to be producing any plate. Um, you're just there to support when things go wrong and you have preventative maintenance tasks where you got to go and check the oil level in all the air compressors and you got to check this and you got to check that and do like your daily rounds to make sure everything's running the way it should. Um, but aside from that, you're not like running the machines. You're only there if something goes wrong, basically. Um, so then the bat phone rings and you're like, Adam, bat phone, Adam speaking. And they're like, hey, Adam, this thing just blew up. Can you come look at it? And you're like, sure, I'll be right down. And then you got to go down and figure out what's wrong and uh, fix it or order parts or lock it out. Um, so you'll show up, lock the thing out, figure out what's wrong, decide if you need to order parts or if you have the part in stock, fix them, fix whatever's wrong with it and take care of it. Um, and that's the great part about plate is that, well, it's great for some people and I guess bad for others is that it's uh, it's all you. You get to decide what's wrong with it. You get to decide if you need to order parts, um, if it's electrical problem, a mechanical problem, a hydraulic problem, a pneumatic problem. Um, if it's a vacuum seal that's bad, it's uh, it's all on you to determine that and order the right stuff and get it up and running again. So, yeah, I, I always forget that you guys just don't inherently. I don't know how I would think that you would magically know what all these things mean when I say it, but I just I never think to explain all this stuff like from uh, from the ground level up. Okay, who else do we got here? Um, do, do, you, do that make you think of any more questions, Adam or Sarah or Michael? Do you have any questions? I think that's that's it for me. Okay. Uh, I have one question. What kind of work do you guys do like with the military? Or do you not do? We, we do try to hire a lot of military uh, guys. Uh, we actually uh, there for a long time, and I, they still might do it. I'm not sure. It, it, that's something HR would know about. But we were going and uh, down to Virginia and trying to recruit people right out of the military to to work for us. And we we actually had quite a few. I mean, I thought Dan, when you were on, I mean, you were uh, um, knew of some guys down there that were right out of the military. Uh, Maury, one of the guys we work with, he's out of the Navy. Uh, the new girl that just started here, she's in the she's actually in the reserves right now, the Naval Reserves. Um, so yeah, we, we try to, we definitely try to support the military. We actually have a vet veterans group that meets, uh, monthly, um, here and schedules events and outside of work actually. So Re Reese, is that what you were talking about? Or were you talking about, um, products that they ship? To I was, I was talking about products. 
Yeah, I think Reese means like defense contractors. Like, are you sending plate that gets turned into like cruise missiles? <laughs> like, I, I think satellite, a lot of aerospace stuff, right? Like satellites, you'd like six? We do do a lot of aerospace stuff. Um, most of our plate goes to a middleman, if that makes sense. Um, we'll sell it to like a metals warehouse and it'll sit there and they'll have customers on their end that, that orders the plate. Um, we have very few uh, places that we send a plate that's end customers. Um, the sheet mill might be a little different. I mean, I know they send stuff to Apple, like for Apple cell phones. Um, they send a lot of stuff to Airstream, Ford, Chevy, Toyota, um, uh, pans. Uh, there's a comp big company that makes pots and pans. We send a lot of metal to them as well. Um, but as us, we uh, as far as plate facility, most of our metal goes to like a middle guy, if you will. We don't typically sell it to end customers. And the, the company that was making, this is back when iPhones had aluminum cases and they would send sheet, would send metal to uh, Foxconn, if you're familiar with them. So Foxconn makes all kinds of stuff. They make motherboards and all kinds of stuff, but they were making the housings for the Apple cell phones and the uh, iPads too. So they were sending yeah. all that out there. Um, we, used yeah. to, we used to take a lot of stuff from the military. Um, when I started here, that's why we have radi uh, radiation detectors out at uh, our scale. Uh, we used to get, you know, half a missiles. Um, <laughs> I remember the one scrap bin had probably about 50,000 AR-15 lowers in it one time that we were melting down. Um, we, the one thing had like 100,000, you know, military carabiners that we were melting down. Airplane wheels. We, get, we used to get a lot of uh, airplane wheels, wheels, jets, uh, girders for, for fighter jets for that are going in our wings. We used to get them and melt them down. Um, but now most of our, our scrap to plate facility gets actually comes from the sheet mill. Yep. So sometimes you'll be using, I'm trying to remember what they call the, the metal that isn't scrap. That's just original. Um, what do you call it? What's that? Prime. prime. Is that what you're talking about? Prime? Yeah. 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 So what Sean is talking about with scrap stuff is you can take all kinds of old pieces of aluminum and melt it back down and turn it into new stuff. Right. So that's also what he was talking about when you're charging the uh, melder, charging the melder is throwing in the material that you're going to melt down and turn into sheet or plate. Um, and if you get wet scrap, old scrap that you're going to melt down and turn into good plate or good sheet, um, it's mostly stored outside just for space reasons. So if you go out and pick up an old piece of aluminum that's out there with a forklift or a whole pallet of scrap and it has snow or rainwater or something in it and you dump it into a hot melter that's full of molten aluminum that's where you run into problems um so yeah. a lot of the stuff that they they cast is repurposing old stuff so when he says he gets old missiles and stuff in it's they're getting they're getting a bulk bulk old aluminum that they can melt back down and turn back into good product yeah. All right. Um, last call for questions. Yeah, I had a question about like, um, I know you said there's classes for like the training of different things. Uh, how long will the, like, the training be? Like, would you have, when you first started working there full time, would it be like um, you do all the classes and then like, uh, what happens if you start full time and you come across something you've never seen before? Like, do you go back to training? Do you get somebody else to help you out with it? Or how does that work? Um, typically, if you just first start, you'll be right on the floor and then you they'll schedule training like you might be there for like three weeks and then you'll go for training for like a week or two depending on what class it is then you'll come back on the floor you'll be with somebody um that's the thing the new new hire a new employee they're they're not going to let them by themselves for a while until they they feel comfortable that they could be by themselves if you have a that's a nice thing if you have a question you you ask, you ask. that's that's the problem and, and and then you know um if you get that class done, you can sign up for another class. Like, like say you come in and you're a new employee and uh, you sign up for pneumatics and you take that pneumatics class. You, they might take you off shift and put you on daylight for a week, maybe two, however long the class is. And then you come back on shift and then you could probably sign up, especially a new, a new hire, sign up for another class. You might go to AC Motors and some of the classes are going to be signed. You're you're going to be signed up automatically. They're going to do that for you. They're going to sign you up for AC motors. They're going to sign you up for mag one and they're going to schedule it in and they'll change your schedule to, to, to go to these classes. Um, but you know, if you're on the floor and you don't have a question, if you run in something that you haven't seen before, 
And, and that's the big thing with even production and maintenance. If you come across something that, that you're unsure of, that you've never seen before, you don't make the decision, you stop and seek and get help. That's, that's, that's a big, that's actually written on the walls all over the place here. Stop and seek help, help. So if you've run into something you're not comfortable with and you're unsure about, nobody's going to get mad at you about it or anything like that. You just stop and you go seek help, whether that be the person you're working with or whether that be making a phone call to somebody, you know, or even off hours. You know, I, I get a lot of phone calls at home on my off hours, but then that's because I'm a tech and, you know, some of the guys on floors, they were you know, calling me for help. So I'm one of their help change. But yeah, all, if you don't unsure, you stop and you, you get help. That's how it is. Hopefully that answers so, your question, but you'll be in a lot of training. Yeah. So if, when you're like, so you're basically getting like mentored by somebody, like you're, you're getting, um, exactly. you're following yeah. somebody around. So it'd be the same person or would that person kind of change every once in a while. Up here, it's the same person. And if you're on a shift down there, it's, it's pretty much going to be the same people you're going to be around day in and day out. Um, the guy that's with me, Brian, he's been with me for a year and a half. And, you know, he and, and he's picking up things extremely fast. So he's almost as good as Dan. <laughs> so, so like kind of if, if you're picking up stuff and you think you're comfortable and then whoever you're mentoring with thinks that, you know, everything that you can teach and then they sign off on you, you, you start full time at that point by yourself or. No, you're you're going to be by you're going to be with somebody all the time unless somebody's on vacation. OK. And you'll, you'll be full time from the time you start. It's not yeah. like you work up to it. You'll start um, working the normal rotation. And whether you, if it's day one and you don't know anything, you're all automatically on full time on your normal rotation shift. It's not like you have to build up to being uh, full time or build up to being on your own. And they're definitely not going to let you on your own um, on a shift by yourself where you're like covering the plate facility and there's no other maintenance guy there until you've been there like, a year and a half, maybe two years or something. There's um, a good chance for the first few months, you're not even going to be allowed an electrical panel. Yeah. So just watching. You won't be allowed to do anything until you start going through our training. You might be going through there. There. Once you go through our training, then we'll let you an electrical panel, but you're going to, you're not even going to be able to get an electric electrical panel until you go through our training. Yeah. But you'll still be there for your whole 12 hour shift and you'll still be a full-time employee and you'll be there the same amount of time in the same shift as whoever else is on your crew. Um, you're just not allowed to for safety reasons because you haven't gone through all the all the training that you need to wear the right protective equipment and all that kind of thing. Or not CPR certified. That's the other thing. You got to be CPR certified. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, I hope everybody uh, answers all the questions that they could think of. The worst part will be if five minutes from now, after we get off of here, they're like, oh, I just thought of a good one. I should have asked. Um, but well, anyway. if, you think of anything, if, you, if you think of anything, Dan, Hey, feel free. I'm off the next uh, seven days. Um, just text me or Facebook message me or something like that. And, uh, you know, I'll yep. get back to you. I said, I'm ripping the car apart tomorrow, but you know, other than that, I'll be free. We'll do. Yeah. But if, uh, if anybody comes to me with more questions that I, uh, don't think I have a good answer for, I'll be sure to let you know that that's what I told him. I was like, well, I, I did this job, but I know a lot of things have probably changed and things are, are different. So I can answer a lot of the questions, but some of them I'm not sure if are accurate anymore when I, when I tell them the way things are. Um, well, thanks a lot for coming on here. Um, I think everybody appreciates it. Everybody had good questions and uh, hopefully everybody learned and got the information that they wanted to get from you. Um, did you have anything? You have any questions for these guys? No, I just, uh, you've, you've joined, a, just a comment, you, you've joined a field where that, that's needed and sought after anywhere in the country right now. I mean, you're in a field that very, uh, a lot of people don't go into this field anymore. And, you know, everybody wants to sit behind a, a keyboard, but, you know, somebody's going to have to work on a piece of equipment. And right now, you know, once you get trained, you can pretty much cut a check anywhere in the country. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, there's nowhere that doesn't need technicians and everybody's aging out of it. And there's a huge gap um, where people were told they had to get a four year degree in, in uh, business or art or something. Um, that was pushed so heavy for so long that there's a, a huge age gap. There's a bunch of people in their 50s and 60s to do this kind of work. And now there's people in their like early 20s that are starting to do it. And in between, there's not much. So. And what, 
what's also is is most uh most of the maintenance guys here make more than any of the supervisors yeah do you remember <laughs> i'm trying to remember that manager that we had up there that didn't believe us when we told him how much we made because he made like half of what we made <laughs> yeah. kirby our boss kirby yeah kirby that's who it was yeah he couldn't believe we, we doubled what he made and he was our boss mm -hmm. that's how it goes so yeah um hopefully this gave you all the information that you would need to know to make a decision whether this is a place you would want to work and again this is specifically we're talking about the plate mill and we mentioned a little bit about sheep but sheep's kind of like a different animal um but the plate is like the go-to move if you want to do dual trading you want to do both because otherwise you'll just be an electrician or just do mechanical stuff and you won't get to you won't get trained on the other side of it and you won't get to touch any of the other stuff either um but you do pretty much everything if you go up the plate so all right i'm gonna get off here i am uh I got eight minutes to uh, meet somebody that's supposed to be dropping off paperwork for a mortgage refi upstairs. So I gotta, I gotta get up there. Um, and also, I think hey, the kids are running around like crazy. Yeah. Hey, have a great day. Thanks a lot. Yep. See you, buddy. Hey, yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yep. No problem. You. All right, guys. I will see you on here at 1 30 tomorrow. Have a good night. All righty. See ya. See ya.